We are live now. MC, please take over. A very warm welcome and welcome back to the third technical session of the day of the international webinar Modern Trends in Microbiology, organized by the Department of Microbiology of St. Xavier's College, Autonomous Kolkata. I would now like to request Assistant Professor Dr. Mahashita Mitra Ghosh to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Shamatrita Bhattacharya. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maitri. Uh, a warm welcome to all the viewers around the world on to the 17th chapter of Modern Trends in Microbiology. We are just uh, initiating the session three of this seminar session. And it's a proud privilege for me to introduce among you, Dr. Shamadrita Bhattacharya, who is currently the post of postdoctoral research scholar in University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center. Shamadrita is an ambitious, innovative, and enthusiastic cardiovascular biologist, having the desire to become a biomedical leader who can bridge the gap between the basic and translational research in the field of heart rhythm disorders. She has a vast expertise on molecular and developmental biology, genetics, genomics, bioinformatics, and biochemistry. We, the members of St. Xavier's family, are proud to introduce Dr. Shamadrita Bhattacharya as she did her integrated MS course in biotechnology from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata in the year 2014. She did her PhD from Southwestern Medical Center, USA between 2014 to 2019 in the field of genetics, development, and disease. Right now, she's a postdoctoral fellow in University uh, uh, of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Her area of research is cardiovascular biology. She has been a brilliant student throughout. So during her stay in Xavier's, she managed to work on different projects abroad during her semester breaks in various renowned universities. She worked in University of Minnesota, studied the role of chromatin remodeling. Then in another summer intern research, she worked with University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and analyzed the genome-wide mapping of origin Excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, you got muted. Okay. Uh, cannot listen to it, anything. Am I audible from the yes, very beginning yes, or not? Right now? Yes, okay. ma'am. So, sorry. So, let's start. Uh, a warm welcome to all the viewers around the world to the chapter 17 of Modern Trends in Microbiology, session three. Uh, we, the members of St. Xavier's family, Department of Microbiology, feel proud to introduce Dr. Shamadrita Bhattacharya, currently a postdoctoral research scholar in University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Shamadrita is an ambitious, innovative, and enthusiastic cardiovascular biologist, having the desire to become a biomedical leader who can bridge the gap between basic and translational research in the field of heart rhythm disorders. She has a vast expertise on molecular and developmental biology, genetics, genomics, bioinformatics, and biochemistry. She did her integrated MS course in biotechnology from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata in the year 2014. She did her PhD from Southwestern uh, University of Texas Medical Center, USA, between 2014 to 2019 in the field of genetics, development and disease. Right now, as I mentioned, she is a postdoctoral fellow in UTSW Medical Center, USA. Her current area of research is cardiovascular biology. During her stay in Xavier's, she managed to work on projects during her semester breaks in various renowned universities. She has been a wonderful scholar from very inception. And I feel myself fortunate to visualize this talented girl growing from her early childhood days. 
I could see this talented girl studying in Auxilium Convent School. Later on, she uh, switched to Bharati Vidya Bhavan. Everywhere, wherever she studied, she always uh, uh, has kept her remark, her her expertise in each and every field, whether it be academia or it be cultural front, and everywhere she has been the topper. I still remember, and I share with all my students in the class that uh, uh, a student named Shamadrita was there in biotechnology and how nicely she used to present her views in the exam papers. I used to get mesmerized that how a student in an undergraduate level can express her views regarding science so clearly. Later on, she, as I said, uh, she did her projects in University of Minnesota, where she worked on studies, the role of chromatin remodeling proteins, DNA damage response under the guidance of Dr. Onindo Bach. She also uh, did uh, contributed sufficiently in University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where she studied and analyzed the genome-wide mapping of origin recognition complex under the guidance of Dr. Shupriya G. Prashant. She did her master's dissertation project from Advanced Center for Treatment, Research and Education Center, Cancer, under the able guidance of Dr. Shorab Dalal. And within this very short span of her scientific career, she has managed to publish 12 international paper, uh, journals in journals of great repute, and that include papers in science, plus one, nature communication, scientific reports, which are basically the dreams of many budding scientists. So I uh, congratulate Shamadrita for publishing journals in such reputed journals. So she has a wonderful leadership qualities. She has not only contributed in academia, as I said, she has been the honor to be the secretary of graduate student organization and served and incoming, uh, and she has served for incoming domestic and international graduate students with social, mental, and professional support by acting as an interface with the graduate school. And apart from this, she has been the student leader for students emerging academia of leaders. So the story is endless, but I want to cut the story short as we are eagerly waiting to listen from uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. She has been project mentor for three undergraduate students and two rotation students. And today she'll be talking, uh, uh, delivering her talk on a very interesting topic, genetics and epigenetics of heart rhythm. All of us are very well aware of the phenomena uh, uh, with the information that 17.9 million people die of cardiovascular diseases every year. Over 55 million people in India were affected by cardiovascular disease in 2006. And this is growing exponentially. So one in four deaths in India are due to cardiovascular diseases with heart disease and stroke responsible for 80% of this burden. So friends, we are well aware of the necessity to en enlarge our study and our knowledge on genetics and epigenetics of heart rhythm. So, with this information, I would like uh, to congratulate Shamadrita and over to Shamadrita. Please deliver your lecture. Shamadrita. Thank you. Thank you, Mahashwata, ma'am, for that very kind introduction. And I will share my screen and then I shall continue. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, your screen is visible. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I was uh, I was uh, amazed at that uh, introduction that uh, uh, Mahashwata Ma'am just uh, told about me, and I'm very uh, thankful and honored that the MTI organizing committee of AKM Sir and the entire microbiology department of St. Xavier's College uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my research work over the last uh, uh, four years that I have been uh, with Dr. Nikhil Munshi in uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center. And uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to tell you today two short stories, uh, uh, broadly as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, 
Mahashwata ma'am told already that uh, uh, I'd be talking today about the cardiac conduction system or what regulates the heart rhythm. But I would also like to touch upon another uh, translational study that I started during uh, the end of my PhD and which I'm continuing as a postdoc in uh, Munchi Lab. So a uh, part one, uh, I have titled it as Defining Mammalian Cardiac Conduction System Gene Regulatory Networks. And this was my PhD work in uh, Dr. Nikhil Munshi's lab. And part two will be more uh, translational uh, study uh, that I was just talking to you about, and we'll get to that. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, the, uh, what you're looking at is a schematic of a four chambered heart. As you all know that there are two atria, which is right here and two ventricles. And uh, what you're also looking at is a mammalian heart. So today we'll be focusing on these three structures, which collectively is called the cardiac conduction system. So they are called the sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, and the ventricular conduction system. So why are these cell types or why are these cells so important and so interesting to us? This is because these conduction system cells helps in maintenance of the electrical activity of the heart. So the electrical impulse is initiated in this structure called sinoatrial node, which is also called the natural pacemaker of the heart. It then uh, propagates the electrical impulse in the red dotted line direction through the atria, undergoes a delay in this structure called AVN, and finally propagates through the rest of the ventricle through these structures that are collectively referred to as the ventricular conduction system. And this sequence of events is very important to maintain a normal heartbeat. And I think you guys are well aware of how clinicians use electrocardiography that is shown in this right corner to routinely check the electrical activity of patients in clinics. Uh, the other introductory point that I would like to uh, bring to your attention, and it will be important is that uh, the heart cells or cardiomyocytes as we call it, uh, there are two types of them. One is the contra contractile cardiomyocytes, which you can imagine it is to be the mechanical cell of the heart, which helps in the contraction and relaxation of the heart muscle. And the other cell type is the conducting cardiomyocyte, which maintains the electrical activity of the heart. And as I just mentioned, these are primarily these three compartments that maintains the electrical activity of the heart. And today's first part of my talk will be focusing on these conducting cells. So why do we care about these conduction system cells, right? So as you already, I, I already mentioned that the normal heart rhythm is maintained by the sequence of these electrical events, and it has to be in this direction to maintain a normal heartbeat and to complete a full heartbeat. And as I already showed you the EKG trace uh, in the previous slide, yeah, uh, as you can see that this is an electrocardiography that is used to uh, measure the electrical activity of the heart. However, when these sequence of events goes awry in the heart, it leads to a myriad of disorders called arrhythmias, a few of which uh, exemplary uh, situations are atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation. And as you can uh, well appreciate from these electrocardiography tra traces that definitely the heart is not in its normal heart rhythm situation. And you can also notice that there are just these aberrant electrical impulse that is just firing randomly in different parts of the heart. The sequence of events is completely uh, disorganized. So, you know, these arrhythmias come in a variety of different uh, uh, symptoms like heart palpitations, uh, abnormal slowing or fast pace of the heart, uh, even up to sudden cardiac death. The, the standard treatment strategies uh, is catheter-guided ablation of these random electrical circuits that is not needed in the heart by using cryo balloons and radio frequency. Uh, and these are the cases when uh, drug therapies don't work as well or has very severe side effects. And the other invasive strategy is, which you guys might all be aware of, is the implantation of an artificial pacemaker to actually get back to the heart into normal heart rhythm. 
However, you know, given all these current standard of therapies, it still only controls or uh, minimizes the symptoms of the disease. It still does not cure the cause of the disease. So that was my goal of my PhD project is to understand what all goes on to maintain this normal rhythm process in the heart so that we can understand what goes wrong in the disease process much better and develop better therapeutic strategies. So uh, over the several years of uh, uh, work in the field, uh, you know, there has been just a very few seminal studies, which I'm going to just uh, give you an overview of the different cellular and molecular networks that has been uh, summarized in this particular cartoon that I'm showing you on this slide. Uh, these were very great studies. I mean, we learned a lot from these studies, but the caveat of most of these studies that led to these different pathways of uh, gene regulation in uh, these conduction system compartments had been primarily done in artificial systems like embryonic stem cells, uh, had been done gene by gene um, analysis, and also uh, it was done more in a whole heart. So nobody really carefully tried to precisely take these cells out from the heart and profile them. And I hope to justify why it was so important for us to take these cells out from the whole heart and study them in isolation. So that brings me to the two technical challenges that we have been facing in the field of conduction system. Uh, the first one is why, why do we basically lack knowledge on the CCS cells is because there are no good genetic tools. Uh, to study these CCS cells. And the second one is it's very hard to isolate these CCS cells from the heart. So to tackle the first uh, question or the first technical challenge, what we uh, did was develop some genetic tools. I also had to develop lots of uh, methodologies, both biochemical and genomic methodologies. And I'm gonna talk to you about in a second. And finally, we developed what we like to call as the CCS Atlas, uh, which was the first mammalian CCS atlas that we developed. So tackling the first question, uh, we were lucky to find a mouse model that specifically labels the SAN structure that is right here, as, as I already told you, it's called the natural pacemaker of the heart. Uh, this model was already available, so we didn't have to make this mouse. However, the next two mouse models that I'll be showing you pictures of, uh, ABN and BCS, uh, they were developed in our lab and I characterized it to great details as a part of my PhD work and I won't be showing any of the uh, published work. So basically this mouse model specifically labels the AV node and this mouse specifically labels the ventricular conduction system as you can see nicely in this fluorescent reporter whole mount microscopy uh, that they really clearly label the Purkinje fibers, which is shown right here, which are the, one of the major components of the ventricular conduction system. So that was great. We finally got a complete set of CCS genetic tools. So how is this genetic tool going to be useful for the community or the field? And to just give you an example, I will give you two short applications of this mouse model, the AV node reporter. So uh, 10 years ago, uh, this group had tried to reconstruct the 3D anatomy of human atrioventricular node. However, this study did not use native uh, immunostaining or antibody staining approaches to actually characterize the structure of the AV node. So we set out in our study to understand uh, the 3D architecture of mammalian AV node in uh, young mouse heart. So what I'm showing you here is a video that we, what I want you to focus on is this fuzzy red or TD tomato stain right here. It is this structure which has these two horns. So this fuzzy red staining actually indicates the atrioventricular node. And this was done by a technique called cubic clearing of the tissue followed by super resolution microscopy. And based off of this 3D anatomy, we uh, developed this uh, uh, 
um, model where we also, uh, with distinct gene signatures, we describe these different parts of the AV node um, that is characterized by distinct marker signatures. And I'll not have enough time to go through the details, uh, but what I want to you guys to take home is that it is very important. It was very important to get a 3D anatomy. Uh, for example, in cases where the clinicians have to go through the catheter and ablate these abnormal electrical circuits, if we have such good models or 3D anatomy, it will actually guide the clinicians better to perform such uh, intricate uh, ablation therapy strategies to cure heart rhythm uh, abnormalities. So with that, I will go on to the next application of our uh, AV node recorder. So, uh, you know, we also wanted to kind of see what kind of cell types populate this AV node region. So in order to understand that, we developed a single cell uh, RNA-seq atlas. And I won't go through the details of the steps, but essentially what you're going to see going to be seeing in the next slide are these plots called TSNE plots, where basically each dot will be representing the entire gene expression profile of a single cell. And we cluster cell types into these individual clusters based on their gene expression profile, uh, based on the similarity of the gene expression profile. So with that, I would like to show you some of uh, my published data from last year. So what we identified on performing single cell RNA-seq in AV node was that there were 20 different cell types in, in the AV node region, which is so tiny. And this fit with the previous uh, description of about six cell types that were identified in rabbit AV node. And we added about another uh, 13 or 14 new cell types. Now, for time purposes, I won't show you the characterization of all these different cell types. What I'll be focusing on is only this particular set of clusters, which we found were cardiomyocytes or heart cells, as we figured out by their expression of this cardiomyocyte marker gene troponin T. So we only took the cardiomyocytes and further subclustered and we found that even within cardiomyocytes, which you can imagine is the major cell type of the heart, there were so many different subtypes. So, you know, this kind of uh, single cell resolution study actually helped us to uh, get this kind of knowledge about the heterogeneity of the cell type that populate this small region called AV node, which is absolutely crucial to maintain normal heart rhythm. So next, I'll move on to the next technical challenge and how I had to overcome um, and develop uh, some cell isolation techniques to take these cells out. But before that, I would like to give you a little bit of comparison of why is it so difficult to take these cells out. So the first comparison I would like to draw is uh, for immune cells. You know, immune cells are kind of easy to access, right? I mean, from whole blood, you can purify and by cell sorting using cell surface markers, you can uh, uh, distinguish different kinds of immune cells and profile them and do all sorts of studies. The next is if you look at brain tissue, it's much less fibrous. So it's, very, uh, it's much easier uh, to isolate single cells from brain. However, when you look at heart, you can very well appreciate from, these, uh, from this diagram that the heart is highly fibrous. It's filled with connective tissue. So, uh, you know, it it's gets very challenging to isolate single cells from heart. And on top of that, adult cardiomyocytes, uh, well, cardiomyocytes from older animals or people, they are very big. So, uh, you know, regular cell sorting techniques like FACTS, uh, fluorescence-assisted uh, cell sorting, cannot really allow you to very uh, specifically sort these cells because it will cause a lot of damage to these cells because they're so big, they won't fit. So with all these, on top of that, the CCS cells are very rare. They constitute less than two to 3% of the whole heart. And anatomically, they're so deeply seated in the heart that it's very difficult to take these cells out. So I came up with a way, and I'll show you in the next couple of slides, to take these cells out and study them in isolation. 
So I'll not go through the details of this method. Uh, it's a biochemical method that I developed where I could bypass uh, sorting cells and in, in fact, isolate nuclei from mouse hearts. And these nuclei uh, were very compatible for different kinds of analysis. And uh, you might be thinking that, oh, then the cells were disrupted and everything, but the nuclei hosts a lot of information. Uh, it has the DNA, it has the nascent RNA, it has the epigenomic landscape that I'll touch on in a bit. So we'll get a lot of information from just and I have shown using different quality control assays that these nuclei were intact, very uh, maintaining their integrity. So there was very little to no damage to these nuclei. Now that's great. We isolated nuclei from these mouse hearts, but what so? Like what are the cell types uh, that these nuclei are, are coming out of? As I told you, the heart is just not made up of cardiomyocytes. It also has fibroblasts, it has immune cells, it has endothelial cells. So we were interested only in the cardiomyocytes because I will show you in the next slide why I'm saying that. And indeed we found that the pure nuclei uh, based on the method that I developed, we could isolate predominantly cardiomyocytes. And I'm showing you an immunostaining to show using two nuclear membrane markers, phospholamban and PCM1 that indeed we were enriching for cardiomyocyte population. So that was great. We were eliminating other cell types like fibroblasts, endothelial cells, which uh, you know, we didn't really want in the study because as I mentioned to you before, that we'll be focusing only on the conducting cells. So the more purer and enriched is the population, the better. But again, still we don't have only the conducting cardiomyocyte. We still have a whole population of cardiomyocyte. So in order to specifically isolate conducting cardiomyocyte, I developed another technique called CCS intact, which is isolation of nuclei tagged in cell types. And I will not go through the details. It's a, it's a genetic trick using mouse models where you can specifically isolate nuclei from your cell types of interest. Basically in my case, it was the SAN, AVN and VCS. And the nuclear membrane gets tagged with epitopes of GFP and MYC and you can pull down using antibodies. So that's exactly what we did. And we enriched for these CCS nuclei. And these nuclei, as I was telling you, are highly compatible for many different genomic analysis. And that's what I'm gonna share with you as uh, the CCS, CCS Atlas. And this study is currently under revision. Uh, but before I tell you about the CCS Atlas, uh, another quick uh, point of introduction is that, uh, you know, so once the whole genome of the human was uh, drafted in 2003, it was observed that about 98.5% of the genome is non-coding, which means it does not code for any proteins, any functional proteins. So, you know, people got really shocked as to what is going on. Is this non-coding regions of the genome all junk? No, it was not so. So the gene, uh, regulatory elements are actually in these non-coding regions. And I'll show you what exactly I mean by that. However, to understand these gene regulatory elements, NIH actually launched this ENCODE project, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It's a huge consortium. The first results were published in 2012. However, we still don't have any representation of my favorite cells conducting cardiomyocytes. So, Basically, that's what we wanted to add to this uh, consortium is the knowledge that we were still lacking on these very important, physiologically important conduction system cells. So uh, just kind of, I thought it would be important to uh, give you a little more background is that if you're looking inside the nucleus, you can see that your whole genome is kind of compacted in the form of chromatin. And there is these closed chromatin, which is inaccessible. And then there is these open regions of the chromatin that is highly accessible. So gene regulation occurs in a fashion where these important proteins called transcription factors come and bind to these DNA elements called enhancers. And it will be very important for my talk. These enhancer elements, I'll be referring to them as 
regulatory elements, enhancer elements. So these are very important for tissue specific gene expression. So once these transcription factors come and bind to enhancers, it will tell the transcriptional machinery, more importantly, the RNA polymerase right here in purple to start gene transcription. So what you can imagine is that's what is called the epigenome, which is basically an instruction manual. The transcription factor comes and binds to these enhancer elements, and then it tells the transcription machinery that, yes, I'm ready for the output, which is basically in the form of gene transcription, what we like to call as the transcriptome. So in order to study the epigenome or the gene regulatory elements that were controlling CCS-specific gene expression, we used a technique called ATAXI, which I'll not go through the details, but essentially it gives you information about the chromatin status in the form of closed chromatin. And you will see a lot of these uh, uh, genome browser maps where closed chromatin will be identified by a flat land and open chromatin will be identified by these little mountains or peaks, as I will call it. And it is these open regions of the chromatin that harbors these distal regulatory elements, or as I was calling these as enhancers, which are right here. Now, what, why I'm calling it as distal is because these enhancer elements are way away from the genes that they are regulating. So that's why they are called distal. So I'll be uh, synonymously using the word distal regulatory elements or distal ataxy peaks, which I'll be referring to also as enhancers. So they're, they're all going to be synonymous for the rest of my talk. So finally, that brings to uh, one of the major highlights of our CCS Atlas study. So what you're looking here is uh, the distal unique open regions of the chromatin, which are essentially the enhancers uh, in a more simplistic uh, fashion. And you can see that each of these compartments that I'm pointing out with arrows have their unique sets of enhancers. So nobody had actually shown to this degree of resolution because it was still not possible to isolate these cell types. And now you can appreciate that it was important to you know, take these cells out so that we could understand how these conducting cardiomyocytes are different from the rest of the heart. So in black is basically my comparator data set, which is the whole heart. So it was important to profile these cells in isolation. Not only that, we also got a lot of mechanistic insight into the biology of these cells. And I'll show you one quick example. So historically, it has been shown this important transcription factor in KX25, which has to be repressed for the SA node to behave as the SA node in terms of their gene program. And it has also been shown that if NKX25 expression gets somehow turned on in SA node cells, it causes a disease called sick sinus disease. So we asked if using our CCS epigenome ataxic data set, we could uncover some more mechanistic insight as to what's going on. And we indeed see that as you can appreciate in the blue line, which is the SA node, there is absolutely no opening of the chromatin. So in, in normal situations, NKX25 locus stays repressed. So it's, it's still like coiled by chromatin remodeling complexes so that NKX25 cannot be weirdly turned on in normal situation. And there is literature uh, that I have sort of referred here that shows actually there are chromatin remodeling complexes that does this in order to make sure that NKX25 is turned off in SNO. So that really fit well with uh, previous studies as well. And we also saw that, you know, there were very many unique regions of chromatin, particularly in SA node, in comparison to other compartments and the whole heart. So we asked, why is SA node so unique? And today, due to shortage of time, I won't tell you the uh, hypothesis-driven story that I have been pursuing as a, a postdoc in Munshi lab, but we have some really cool insight into why this SA node is so unique. I mean, you can... Uh, understand one obvious thing is that SA node is called the natural pacemaker of the heart. It's where the electrical impulse is fired, the beginning of the electrical impulse. So of course, it will be different from the rest of the conduction system compartments, but we didn't expect 
that it would be so much open and so much different. So I'll not be talking about this project, but what I wanted to show you is that our CCS Atlas has helped us to uncover more new and important insights into conduction system biology. So next, we wanted to validate functionally if the enhancers that we were uh, obtaining from our CCS epigenomic maps were indeed functionally doing something inside mouse hearts or inside human hearts, what is going on with these enhancers? So in order to do that, uh, we turn towards this uh, existing database called Vista Enhancer Browser. What essentially this database is, is basically it hosts a lot of human and mouse experimentally validated enhancers from different tissues like brain, heart, et cetera. So it has already been proven in this database that this enhancer was actually regulating tissue specific gene expression. So we took advantage of this database and we focused only on the enhancers that had been experimentally validated in heart. And we asked uh, using various histology techniques that I'll be showing you in the next few slides as to if these enhancers were indeed regulating uh, CCS specific gene expression. And we screened about 22 such uh, embryo. So how this uh, assay works is basically you take your enhancer fragment, you clone it um, into this uh, plasmid and you inject it in mouse fertilized eggs. And the embryos that come out of that pregnancy, uh, depending on where that enhancer was active, you will see blue signal in definite tissue that that enhancer is regulating. So in my case, I was looking at blue signal in heart. However, what this database does not tell you is where in heart this blue signal is coming from. So in order to carefully look we went through and performed histology across all these 22 embryo hearts. And today for time sake, I'll show you just one example that I'm pointing out in the red box. So upon cross-sectioning and performing histology on these embryo hearts, we found one example that I'm showing you today is this blue signal that I was talking about is highly uh, specific to SNO region. And of course, I did a lot of anatomy based, you have to take my word for it right now, but this is where the SNO region is. Uh, so it is indeed uh, controlling SNO specific tissue specific gene expression. And we also validated some of the genes that this enhancer was regulating using single cell RNA-seq uh, that I won't be having too much time to uh, go into details. So we performed the same sort of analysis for all the 22 enhancer embryos that I showed you in my previous slide. And we also, uh, using all this information that we get about transcription factors, about enhancers, about the genes that are being regulated, we created these complex gene regulatory networks uh, using lots of uh, uh, computational algorithms that I won't have time today to give you details of. But what essentially you're seeing is a connectome of transcription factors that are basically in this uh, uppercase and they're connected genes to which uh, they are known to be regulating the expression of. So we also uh, looked at transcription factors that have been shown in biology to be very important in conduction system development. And we indeed found that our study also found the same previously established transcription factor gene interactions. However, we also found in our study um, that was novel was that there were each compartment specific gene regulatory networks that I don't have time to show you today. Next, I have to give you a little brief uh, introduction uh, before my last slide of part one is this concept of genome-wide association study. So a genome-wide association study is essentially uh, an association of a particular gene uh, to a particular disease or a particular trait. So for example, if you take the example of uh, variation in height between you know, all of us, uh, what people do basically is they sequence a lot of genome for many different individuals with different height 
And using lots of statistical analysis, uh, they find that the GG nucleotide pair, if a person has GG nucleotide pair, has a higher association with shorter height than a person with AA nucleotide at the same location of the chromosome. So these are called the single nucleotide polymorphism, which makes me different from all the rest in terms of height. And once these SNPs are identified, or single nucleotide polymorphism, as I'll be calling it as SNPs, they are given some IDs. However, this is still an association study. It still does not tell you if this particular nucleotide is actually the causal SNP. So in order to do that, people go through a lot of more statistical analysis that I won't be talking to about. And finally, to functionally validate if this SNP is actually doing something we have to functionally manipulate this SNP perturb using mouse models, using human IPSC cell lines, using CRISPR-Cas9 approaches to functionally say that, yes, indeed, this SNP is causing difference in height between individuals. So similar GWA studies exist for many different traits. In my case, I was looking only at the EKG traits. So as I was telling you that EKG uh, is used or measuring the electrical activity of the heart. And to be a little bit more specific, different parts of this EKG gives you different information. So say for example, this uh, P wave till the R wave, which is the center of this tall peak, will give you how your AD node is functioning and so on and so forth. So different parts of the EKG trace gives you specific information about which compartment is behaving in how, what fashion. So we asked if our CCS Atlas was able to connect these different EKG traits more specifically, because nobody had really, people has described a lot of GWAS uh, variants or GWAS SNPs uh, from uh, uh, you know, human studies where they have associated Hey, example, X gene is associated with heart rate variability. Example, Y gene is associated with PR interval variability. So we asked if we can make a list of these SNPs tighter and more compact and find exactly which SNPs are controlling uh, heart rate variability. And if we could do that using our SA node, AV node, and VCS uh, database that we just uh, generated. And in order to do that, we had to first lift over the human SNPs into our mouse data. And then indeed we find statistically significant uh, that we can actually make these connections. That SA node taxi data set was indeed able to reclassify heart rate specific traits. AV node taxi data set was indeed able to classify PR specific data sets. And this degree of uh, specificity of information is very important when you're designing uh, treatment strategies uh, for patients. So with that, I'll summarize part one. I showed you how we developed novel mouse models, how we developed two biochemical assays to isolate nuclei and particularly the rare CCS cells, how we generated CCS atlas how we also functionally went in and validated these enhancer elements that were regulating CCS specific gene expression. And we, I also showed you how we can use this information to generate these complex gene regulatory networks. And finally, how we could uh, assign more specific SNPs to individual compartments using our mouse uh, CCS atlas. So with that, I would like to switch uh, to my part two, which is a shorter part of my talk. And uh, this is a more translational study. And it was so exciting that I decided to stay back as a postdoc in Munchila. And this study is also currently under review. So the, uh, this study basically started off uh, with, the, with the little bit of introduction that I'm going to give here. So uh, primarily, there are three forms that we uh, archive human heart tissue. One is uh, FFPE preserved, one is fresh frozen, and one is cell culture biobank. However, uh, primarily fresh frozen tissue is uh, majorly used for all these omics studies. 
so in order to, however, you know, only skin biopsies or tumor biopsies undergo such studies. There are very limited studies from uh, human heart tissue, uh, which is my favorite model organ. So why is that? Because there are a lot of issues in collecting heart specimens and I will not have time to talk to you about, but uh, what I got the opportunity in Munshi Lab was to develop a tissue biobank, a primary human heart tissue biobank uh, from donor hearts that were rejected from heart transplants. So I made a highly curated anatomically organized uh, uh, dissection of uh, about 14 human heart tissue specimen uh, from 14 different healthy individuals uh, in collaboration with uh, our cardiothoracic surgery uh, department. And also we got hold of some diseased specimens that I will be talking to about in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bayona. So when we got these healthy samples, I thought, can we use our cardiomyocyte nuclei isolation technique to also study these uh, human heart tissue specimens? And I'll give you my study design and why is it so exciting? But essentially after much optimization, we also find that yes, indeed we can successfully apply my methodologies in uh, human heart tissue specimen. And I'm again showing you immunostaining. These are two markers that I showed you previously with mouse heart cardiomyocyte nuclei. And you can see that uh, indeed it is enriching for cardiomyocyte nuclei in this case, which is our point of interest. So that's great. With the success of this observation, uh, we went on to expand our study to other disease or cardiomyopathy patient samples upon collaboration with Dr. Pradeep Mamon. And we also have some autopsy specimens that I won't be talking to about today in our tissue biobank. Okay, so by way of background of uh, just very briefly, the kind of cardiomyopathies that will be my part, that, that will be a part of my study design is that if you look at this condition called non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, what happens is the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart gets very dilated. So this results in poor blood flow. Next is ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is a condition again, in which the heart suffers a heart attack or because of coronary artery disease, as you can see, because the blood cannot flow through these arteries due to the deposition of these uh, atherosclerotic plaques. And the third category that I will be using in my study is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the ventricular wall in the left side becomes very thickened, so the heart cannot pump, contract, relax properly. So that brings me to my study design where we basically used healthy samples and these three different cardiomyopathy uh, samples. And in black uh, boundary, I'm showing you the region of the heart tissue that was uh, obtained uh, for doing all the analysis. And we again used our favorite cardiomyocyte nuclei isolation method and performed epigenomic maps or generated epigenomic maps. Now, to point out one important thing is that, you know, why am I so excited about epigenome is because epigenome is much more stable than transcriptome, which comes from RNA. As you might uh, uh, imagine or understand that RNA is very unstable. It, it, it degrades in, in minutes. So from the time we collect the heart specimens from these patients, it has to be really fast. So the RNA already starts degrading. So we rationalized that if we could use our epigenomic maps to profile these different cardiomyopathy with respect to healthy patients and use that to drive disease specific etiology over conventional RNA-seq based approaches, it would really uh, you know, expand um, a lot on the information that we can get from these human heart specimens. So what I'm showing you again, as I was telling you, is that uh, this is a locus called troponin T1, uh, which is highly cardiomyocyte specific locus. And we find that across all the samples of patients from all the categories, it's very nice and uniformly open. So we use this sort of uh, plots to kind of check the quality of how our epigenome maps came out to be. Now, what I'm also showing you in the next example is a disease-specific locus called NPPA. 
It actually encodes for a protein called ANP or atrial natriuretic peptide, which has been shown as a stress marker or a biomarker for cardiovascular diseases. And as you can appreciate that this particular gene, if NPPA is highly open in disease and not so much in healthy. So we were very happy to see these kind of resolution of our results that we can make such distinction between disease states and uh, when you compare it against healthy states. So these are the kind of information we can get from epigenomic data. So that's great. So what we uh, asked was uh, in a blinded fashion, we did not know which patient ID came from which category. And we asked if by using principal component analysis, which is essentially a mathematical algorithm, where you again reduce all the data points of a particular sample to a point. So each dot is basically a patient sample. We asked if using principal component analysis, we could categorize these different cardiomyopathies with respect to healthy heart in a blinded fashion. And we indeed find that this clustering segregates disease specific samples from the healthy samples, as you can appreciate here. Next, we again used another uh, parallel algorithm called unsupervised clustering, where we again went in in a blinded fashion and asked if we could also find out genomic signatures that were different from one disease state to the other with respect to healthy. And we indeed find in this heat map that there are very specific ataxic genomic signatures or epigenomic signatures that really distinguishes, for example, ischemic from healthy, non-ischemic from healthy, and hypertrophic from healthy. So, you know, if we can get this amount of information from epigenome, we can actually switch away from RNA-seq based approaches, which is much more unstable as a nucleic acid. So that was an amazing finding. And just as a point of biological confirmation, I also looked at GWAS traits, as I already described to you, for cardiovascular diseases. And we find, uh, as a comparison with healthy, uh, very relevant GWAS traits that were enriched, like resting heart rate, QRS duration, systolic blood pressure. And uh, as an example of a disease state, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we also found relevant GWAS SNP or traits that were enriched in our analysis, like LV hypertrophy, ventricular tachycardia, myocyte fibrosis, all of which are very relevant terms that are associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this was a, a point of biological confirmation that our ataxy or epigenomic maps were really giving us uh, right and important information. Next, what we also did was a transcription factor motive enrichment analysis where we use our epigenome maps and ask what are the transcription factors that bind to these ataxy peaks or open regions of chromatin. And today, due to a shortage of time, I won't go through the details, but we do find many, many relevant transcription factors that has been previously alluded to each of these disease states and also in maintaining a healthy heart state. So that's great. So, uh, you know, all of the data that I showed you today was on fresh frozen tissue, but uh, you know, it, it routinely in a diagnostic lab, people collect these FFPE uh, blocks, which are formalin fixed paraffin embedded blocks, where they can preserve these tissue specimens for several, several years to perform histology, uh, pathology, and these are primarily used for uh, diagnosis of patients. Um, so we thought if we could extend our methodology, not just on fresh frozen tissue, but in fact extended it to these FFPE blocks. Uh, you know, it would be even better because it would open up a lot more opportunities and we just don't have to depend on uh, getting a fresh rejected heart from a, from a dead person. Uh, so I'll not go through the details, but we have very convincing evidence that indeed this methodology can uh, extend or can be extended and also give you this rich information that I showed you in my previous couple of slides, even using FFPE blocks, sorry, even using FFPE specimens. Now, why was that important is because these FFPE preserved tissue is very difficult to isolate anything out of. Uh, they're highly fixed 
They have been stored for tens and 20 of years. So this was an important extension of our technique. The final slide that I would like to show you today is you know, an ongoing development of a qPCR-based assay to potentially use as a diagnostic tool to detect these cardiomyopathy subtypes. Now, as I already showed you, these genomic signatures that were specific to each category. So we thought if we could design qPCR instead of always having to go through these entire process of next generation sequencing, uh, bioinformatics, computational biology, uh, kind of like COVID detection assays that people have been using qPCR. It's a quick readout. So in order to do that, uh, I really had to spend a lot of time in coming up with these uh, specific locus that were highly open in one category. Here I'm showing you an example of a, of a gene that is highly open in ischemic cardiomyopathy and absolutely not open in the other categories. So these are the kind of uh, uh, genomic regions or locus that we are targeting for our qPCR assay to detect like a binary detection. If it is ischemic, if it is not ischemic, if it is non-ischemic, if it is not so. And we have other example, uh, exemplary loci that can distinguish all the other subtypes. Um, however, it was uh, kind of not trivial to design primers because as you might imagine that not every patient has the same degree of the disease, not every patient has the same mechanism that uh, that leads to the disease. So we kind of followed this paper. Uh, it's a great paper uh, that recently came out where we have to define uh, this, you know, like a common region against which we could design our qPCR primers. And I won't have time to show today, uh, but we have some really exciting data that indeed this could be a future uh, diagnostic tool for detecting cardiomyopathy subtypes. With that, I would like to summarize. So hopefully in part two, I have shown you how our epigenomic maps helped us categorize cardiomyopathy etiology over conventional RNA-seq based approaches, how we are developing a potential diagnostic tool and how uh, you know, we are extending our study to fixed archived tissue specimens like FFPE blocks that I was talking to about. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my mentor, who has been uh, an amazing support since 2016, and uh, you know he's so good that I decided to stay in his lab uh, for postdoc, which is not an usual case. Uh, all the lab members, uh, American Heart Association, who funded my work in uh, uh, in my predoctoral work, uh, all our collaborators uh, who helped us with the bioinformatics, with histology, with all the human tissue specimens. Uh, with all the enhancer embryo assays that I was talking to you about, the sequencing core, the histology core, and the bioinformatic core. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take more questions. Uh, thank you, Shamanprita, for your illustrious talk. You have uh, really uh, contributed enormously uh, in the area of uh, cardiovascular diseases. And uh, I am uh, again mesmerized with the volume of work and the area where from you started from scratch and uh, you are on the verge of developing diagnostic tools. So these kinds of uh, things take at least 12, 10 to 12 years. And you have done this wonderful job within a short span of five years. And I wish that uh, our students would have been much more happy if you could have taken two more classes and you could have <laughs> started. I'd be uh, more uh, than happy. You just let me yeah, know yeah, and I'll, I'll have, figure uh, out. And I was also enjoying, but what I was finding that um, uh, that the volume of work that you have done um, is really mesmerizing. So you started with uh, the... Uh, uh, cell culture development techniques and how to isolate the nuclei. Then you discussed about the CCC enhancers. Mm -hmm. And you also said about uh, genome-wide associated studies uh, and SMPs and involvement of their uh, roles. And finally, you were, most importantly, you have discussed about the epigenomic signatures to distinguish between uh, the different types of cardiovascular diseases, whether it is ischemic, non-ischemic, or whatever. So what I guess is that this kind of studies will definitely help uh, the doctors in the upcoming years to diagnose their patients in a much better way, right? Because if, if more and more informations are there, 
then uh, the study, uh, this study will definitely help uh, for better treatment by the doctors. Absolutely. That's why I guess that these studies are very important. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to add, I didn't have time to show today. We also have some really cool data that, uh, so not all the time, the, as you were saying, the doctors do not have the ability all the time to clearly diagnose these cardiomyopathy categories. Right, right. There are certain cases where it's like a combination of some, some part of it is non-ischemic like, some part of it is like ischemic like. So, so the are, informations will become more clear, right? Yes. The, the, the kind so, of study that you are doing uh, is definitely, uh, the, especially the diagnostic tool that you're going to de uh, develop uh, in uh, very soon. Yeah, that is, hopefully. That is going to help uh, the medical world in a very better way. So uh, congratulations, uh, Shamadrita. I wish you. that uh, you do more and more and uh, our scientific community and the medical fraternity gets benefit from your research. So thank you very thank you. much. And uh, there are certain questions uh, as because the students are from BSC. Uh, so I don't know uh, uh, whether- No, I, I really tried my best uh, to kind right, of keep right. it as so, simple as possible, but it's sometimes just not- Right, as because they are a mm, uh, uh, little junior. So they are asking some simple questions that uh, in the era of uh, pan the pandemic of, uh, because of the pandemic of uh, COVID, some patients in whom COVID-19 is suspected should have a baseline ECG performed before the entry into the healthcare system. So how does COVID-19 affects CCS and how can this be curbed if its effect decreased? So the question is raised by Ishita Shorkar. That's a great question. Yeah, so already many studies are coming out where they are showing that uh, people who have even recovered from COVID has uh, uh, predisposition to certain types of cardiomyopathy. Uh, now, I haven't followed the cardiomyopathy uh, clinically, uh, liter clinical literature as much, but my, my mentor, he's a cardiologist, and uh, he also sees patients, finds a lot of different uh, uh, arrhythmias that are developing, um, a lot of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation-like symptoms that are developing in these COVID patients during and also post-recovery. So we still haven't conducted any studies in COVID patients. I think my mentor is uh, trying to write a grant uh, to get funding to combine COVID-19 uh, effects of in infection on cardiac conduction system, essentially. But I don't think uh, I, I have a very good answer. But definitely from uh, uh, just observational and circumstantial evidence, uh, there is a high predisposition of these patients, even after they recover, towards uh, conduction abnormalities. Great, thank you. And another question uh, that is being raised by Shomodip Vishash, he is stating that how to disrupt the cell membrane and preserve the nuclear membrane and the information inside it. Yeah, so that's a great question. It took me about six to eight months to, to get to that point. So I didn't go through the details of the steps and you can read my paper if you're interested. It's the PLOS One 2019 paper. But there is a step called downsing. So you use like a little glass tube and a little glass. It's like a pestle and a mortar. So uh, when you, you just have to optimize, uh, say, for example, 10 times you have to push up and down so that only the cell membrane disrupts and not the nuclear membrane. And then you purify the nuclei on this glucose gradient so that it gets rid of all the other organos like mitochondria, like uh, Golgi bodies, et cetera, and you can only enrich for nuclei. So yes, I, I did show all the different steps such that the cell membrane was disrupted and not the nuclear membrane, but there are ways you can do that. Okay, and, uh, and somebody called Raven is asking a question, what is the name of the markers used during these techniques? But he hasn't mentioned which techniques. Uh, what yeah, I, I think markers? what I understand, and from what right. he's asking is I showed a couple of immunostaining uh, of cardiomyocyte nuclei. So right. I think uh, I want to clarify, as I was telling you, immune cells have cell surface, but cardiomyocytes do not have cell surface markers. What I used was nuclear membrane markers. 
So there has been two good cardiomyocyte nuclear membrane markers that I used for enriching for cardiomyocyte nuclei. So one is phospholambam and one is PCM1 or pericentriolar material. So these are the two cardiomyocyte nuclear membrane markers. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, and another question is almost similar uh, to the first one. It's again by Rishi Modok. He's asking that is there uh, interrelation between those suffering from cardiovascular diseases and COVID-19 infection? So that you have yes, already addressed. Yes, I mean, definitely it's, it's a long way to go and uh, all the research is all happening, starting. So yeah, it's a great question. Actually, uh, I guess the problem is uh, when it is, uh, studies will start now. When, if a person exactly. gets cured exactly. from covid then right. we can uh, have those patients if they were having a, a comorbidity of some cardiac patient, cardiac exactly. problems. Then uh, exactly. Then those are your, will be the your subjects of study. Means they Absolutely. are having cardiac issues and they have recovered from COVID. Then exactly. if you get those samples and it will Absolutely. take at least five to six months of time and you get yes. ample number of such samples and only any conclusion can be drawn, I guess. Absolutely, totally. You just designed my study for my next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, as, as you were saying, the studies are all starting now because it has also been kind of predicted by Dr. Anthony Fauci and, you know, all these guys that the cardiomyopathies or these conduction system uh, heart rhythm disorders, they're all going to be a long term effect. It might not show up immediately. But these might be long-term effects that we should really be, you know, taking into consideration and be mindful of that, you know, just because you recovered from COVID does not mean that you won't have any long-term effects. Exactly. This is the major problem with those patients having comorbidities that even though they are Correct. Um, recovering from COVID, but the effects afterwards can be understood in the later part of their lives. Right. Uh, Mohsheta, I have a question. Can I? Yeah, yeah actually, yeah. Shamadrita, I was just thinking, first of all, wonderful work. AV node, you have actually decoded. So that's wonderful. <laughs> Decoding of Thank AV you. node. Now, my question is, sometimes when the AC node is failing, the AV node takes its function. That's ectopic yes. pacemaker. Yes. So is yeah, there any, any change at that point of time? switching on and switching off or epigenetic modification, which will make the AV node now the leader, now the boss. So that's that's a fantastic point. And yes, I did not get time to mention as uh, uh, Akim sir was telling that, you know, when the SA node stops functioning, the AV node is called the secondary pacemaker. So that takes over and that tries to maintain the normal heart rhythm. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have, uh, you know, any, any patient specimens that I could uh, get such samples from where I could do such studies. And in mouse models, I my primary work was to first understand how the normal sequence of events work. Uh, so yes, it is a great question. I, uh, I, it, it, it definitely, we, we should go back and do something where we, uh, you know, induce injury in the SA node, uh, say for example, in a mouse model, and it is doable. We go and injure the SA node and redo the same sort of analysis or studies where we see how the AV node is taking over and how the AV node. But no, I don't think there are such studies that exist. Uh, people have done such stuff. Uh, it has just purely been based on clinical observations from electrophysiology from doctors where they see that, yes, the AV node is the one which takes over. But... Uh, it still, you know, does not function. The heart still does not function as normally as it would be when the SA node would be functioning. So eventually that patient has to be put on antiarrhythmic agents. Um, uh, the patient eventually has to be uh, undergoing some sort of uh, treatment therapy. So, um, yeah, but that's a great point. I don't have a very good answer. Thank you. Actually, then, uh, can we think in this way that a time will come we will not need any external pacemaker? So we can exactly. regulate our own pacemaker and we can just survive. So that is where we are pointing, perhaps. With maybe, it. maybe. The, yeah, maybe. Someday, for sure. Uh, yeah, like evolution will probably, you know, uh, guide. I, I think that's why evolution has developed these different parts of the conduction system. If you think about in an evo-devo uh, concept that, you know, if this SNO fails, then there is a backup. 
So I, I'm pretty sure, you know, over the years of evolution, that might be the case where, you know, one could be dispensable over when the other one takes over. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Over to Moshita. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Shamadrita. Again, uh, it, uh, I, what I, uh, I can say uh, that uh, uh, we want to listen more and more from you. But just yeah. we have got uh, a limited time span, so Absolutely. we will finish off here. And yeah. uh, our heartiest congratulations to you for your wonderful work and contribution in the era of science, which is definitely going to help not only the scientific community, as I said, it is uh, going to help the medical fraternity, which is the need of the hour, right? So the doctors and the scientists should have to move hand in hand. And you are yes. supposed to be the best combination, being daughter of two doctors. So <laughs> I am really, very happy to see you uh, doing such good science. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed uh, this uh, great conversation and getting to see you all after such a long time. So thank you. And thank you to Ankita for... Um, you know, uh, really convening all the emails and uh, just answering my million questions. And uh, I'm a very email person. So I'm, I'm sorry if I harassed you quite a bit, Ankita. It was my pleasure to interact with you, ma'am. <laughs> so I would now uh, like to request uh, Dr. Ghosh to uh, present our guest speaker with an e bouquet and an e memento. <laughs> and an e-certificate. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'll treasure it for the rest of my life. Thank you very much. Right. I would um, now like to request uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Arup Kumar Mitro and uh, the convener of Modern Trends in uh, Microbiology to begin with the valedictory session uh, as well as present us with the final vote of thanks. So I want to thank Shamadrita for the excellent lecture and we, we say so we ended so nicely with a, with a fantastic you. lecture and we thoroughly enjoyed and really it, it proved that where we have landed in developmental biology. Once when I saw that vibrating cells in, of cardiomyocytes growing in tissue culture, I was excited. But now even the individual cells have been decoded. So that's really wonderful. And the functions which is switching on and switching off and the epigenetic modification. Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you should very have much. the heart to understand the heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So we will start the valedictory session. You are most welcome to stay. And we will start the program now. And I will be announcing the different winners. of different session, just give me one sec. So, so we actually, before we start announcing the prizes, I just want to say a few words about Modern Tense 2020. There was a lot of difficulty. I was very depressed. All of a sudden, March 21st, we were told in the controller's office, even the classes discontinued from 15th of March and from 21st of March, we were told that you are not coming anymore to college. You have to stay back. So the immediate reaction was, that all these students were presenting and I was selecting them for modern trends in microbiology, chapter 17. Then I, I had this hope that everything will become normal, maybe in one month, two months, three months time. Then again, after that, 
I think that was May twentieth. There was a devastation. Amphan all over West Bengal. The lower Bengal was devastated, and then there was some hope that again we have to start the classes and we will be a virtual campus. That opened a new challenge, and this challenge was to teach the students online and at the same time to have the preparation for modern trends. So I must say here, we were the first department to organize an international webinar in the form of Frontiers in Biological Sciences. That was a landmark because Father Principal told me that we should have some international seminar and we did it. And I think we did it in June, if I'm not wrong. So that particular event, definitely the conveners of the student conveners, Sri John, Modhura, Moitre, they all imparted a lot of confidence. And subsequently, there was a plethora of different international events taking place in the college. So then it gave me confidence. Now we should think of modern trends. Modern trends, I could now understand that it will be in totally virtual platform online. And so I started interacting. By the time we set up committees and the committees start functioning. But the most important thing was to complete the unfinished job. That is to listen to my dear students and to select them for the oral presentation. So it was also done. And I did it along with the cooperation of my dear students of UG and PT. So after that, we now reset the committees. We actually fixed up the dates and started contacting the speakers. And ultimately, we could contact all the speakers. And this is for the first time that this particular seminar or webinar is not only international, but truly it's global. You must appreciate, we must appreciate ourselves that over the past three days, there has been more than 12,000 view in YouTube. So it is really remarkable for a department in a college in Kolkata city. And I must inform this to Father Principal. Really, we are proud of our department. You should be proud of your alma mater and you should be more proud because the moment you listen to these speakers, you must also understand that they were once a student like you in this institution and they have reached that much. So why can't you? You also can reach. And this is high time to apply yourself, to motivate yourself, and thereby the journey will start from now. Don't get demotivated. People will say that I am psychologically down. I don't have enough to do because I am not being allowed to go out of my home. But we have proved it. We can do a lot by staying at home. And modern trends in microbiology is one such event which will, which at least I will cherish the rest of my lifetime. So with these words, I start declaring the results. So we start with the day one presentations, the undergraduate presentations. I think there were six groups presenting and I shall start from third position. The third position goes to and the moment I announce the name, I would request the webmaster to just display the certificates so they feel honored. Ayush Bagchi and Stuti Borua, third position. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. I will be very happy. Yes, whenever I call your names, I want to see you also, see you smiling, because that also motivates me. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. The second position goes to Sharonna Kundu and Kishol Roy. Thank, thank you, sir. 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 Good. 
and the first position goes to Srija Kaur and Shuparna Das. Congratulations to Srija and Shuparna. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This brings me to the yes, postgraduate department or postgraduate presentation of day one. The third position goes to Piyasha Bonik and Ankit Kumar Nath. Thank you. So sir. I must see you again. Thank I you, congratulate sir. you. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. And second position goes to Ankita Dotto Chaudhuri and Shobhik Banerjee. Incidentally, Ankita is also the student convener of this Thank modern you, trends in microbiology. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Shobhik and Ankita. Wonderful. And the first position goes to Madhura Mondol and Srijan Bhattacharya. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Great. So that was about day one. And it brings me to day two for the undergraduate presentation. The third position goes to Pallav Ghosh and Shohini Chatterjee. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Congratulations sir. to both Thank of you. you. And second position goes to Shomok Shur and Sanjana Lahiri. Thank you, sir. Congratulations Thank you, sir. to both of you. Thank you so much. Very good. And the first position goes to Akanksha Shaw and Moina Bera. Congratulations again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Great. So this brings me to the postgraduate presentation for the second day. The third position goes to Devdatta Dash and Shubhajit Chakraborty. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Second position, where is the certificate? Yes, I must see the certificate. Great, good. Second position goes to Moitrei Sharkar, the MC of this evening, and Tanishta Biswas. Thank Congratulations, you, sir. Moitre and Tanishta. Thank Great. you, sir. Where is Tanishta? Good. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And the first position goes to Angshu Shaw and Spandon Buitto. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. See, this certificate means a lot. Though we don't give you memento, but still it means a lot. So that was all about the oral presentation. This time we had a different types of session. That is mini presentation. This mini presentation were actually replacing the poster presentation. So in the mini presentation, we had joint third. From MSc, we had Sveta Mahanta and Shuchishmita Shikdar. Thank you, sir. Thank Congratulations you, sir. to both of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And from UG, it was Dibbo Mojumdar and Shambriddhi Goldar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We come to the second position. That is Mohima Shaha and Mollar Dashgupto. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. 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 And finally, the first position goes to Niti Choudhury and Srijit Shaha. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Niti. 
She was the webmaster and Srijit. I want to see both of you. Where are you? Sir. Here, sir. Great. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, <clears throat> that brings me to the presentation by students belonging to other institution. Now, let me be very clear. I was not very well these two days somehow, but I made it a point that I was present all over. I was present all through those sessions and I was trying to listen to your lectures, trying to listen to your work. A general advice to all of you, when you are presenting, please only present the important things. Just learn from the presentation done by these speakers, the guest speakers. You should not write too many things in your slide. Make your slide more figurative. That only will make your presentation more interesting. And always when you are presenting, you must conclude what you have presented. That summary is so important. Otherwise, the presentation becomes diluted. And I really want to thank Professor Dipankar Roy and Professor Sanjana Ghosh for helping me in conducting this particular presentation, which was pretty tedious because it was all through from 1 p.m. till it continued till almost 5.30. So thank you very much. I'll just... Sorry about it. So I come back. I come back to the presentation by the external students and research scholars. We are recognizing the scholars and the students separately because I do feel that the students cannot work to the level of the scholars. So the scholars should be judged separately and the students should be judged separately. And I think that is justified. So instead of giving three certificates, we will be giving six certificates, dividing you into senior and junior, where the senior group represents the scholars and the junior group represents the students. So if the head of the department is here, Sudeshna ma'am, you are there? Sudeshna ma'am is there or yes, not? Sir. Sudeshna? Yes. Please, yes. If you do the honors, you congratulate and I want you to hand over the virtual certificates to the external students. I will call out the names. So the scholars, the third position, goes to Devoshri Bhattakur 
from i think assam university yeah thank you sir so sudeshna ma'am please do the honors uh congratulation devoshri bhat thakur actually whatever i can remember in today's morning session uh, you had also put a very wonderful question to dr vaidyanath am i right devoshri yes sir yes ma'am yes i think you have enjoyed congratulations devoshri thank you thank you so much thank you now the second position now when you are receiving it's nice that you can switch on your video one minute sir yeah okay congratulations thank, thank you thank you sir thank you thank you so much thank you for organizing such a wonderful webinar and give us the platform giving us the platform to share our ideas thank you so much for this thank you once again the second so, position goes to aporajita chakraborty aporajita chakraborty i think belongs to biotechnology department or can you can you just uh, can you okay. is she there oh she is not there i think she belongs to the biotechnology department so yeah she said she, she said she joined but uh, i guess somehow she got disconnected apurajita if you are there she belongs to the biotechnology department and i think she is working under sudipa shaha so she is not there she just wrote congratulation apurajita so she couldn't join for that okay so the first position goes to priti verma from university of kolkata calcutta university priti you are there yes sir thank you so much thank you so, so much priti congratulations yes, yes congratulation priti uh, congratulation for your paper presentation i i also i also want to congratulate priti because she was very sincere and when she came for uh, doing summer training under dr anindita banerji uh, so she is very wonderful very nice uh, student. so is anindita there anindita yes. ma'am you are there congratulations yes. priti i'm so, so happy for you you said very well as i said you said very well right very nice Very, very nice. Very point. Very precise. Congratulations. Very well presented. Very congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Organizers and conveners of NCI. So, the prizes for the junior section, and I really want to congratulate each and every student because they were so enthusiastic, and some of them. we are actually doing good research and i am really happy that undergraduate or postgraduate students are taking up individual projects and doing fantastic work this is the beginning of science culture in this country i am really happy so we third we, we start with the third position incidentally this result will indicate how steep was the competition because we have two groups placed in third position and that included yasha dhor and joseph twiri thank you so much thank sir ma'am so, and so congratulations you so you are from university yes. of glasgow yes. so you yes. added an international flavor to this webinar congratulations thank you so much congratulations joseph twiri for your wonderful presentation of paper congratulations thank you ma'am now we have the other group triporna chakraborty and trina ganguly thank you sir triporna you belong to which university uh I belong to West Bengal University of Animal and Fishery Sciences. Great. So, Sudeshna ma'am, please do the honor. Congratulations, Trina, Trina Ganguly, for your wonderful paper presentation. Congratulations. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now we come to the second position. The second position goes to Dattatriya Mukherjee. Sudeshta, ma'am. Yes. You, uh, Dr. There? Uh, yes, sir. I am. I am here. Okay. So I want to congratulate Dattatriya Mukherjee for your mm -hmm. wonderful presentation of paper. A study to access association of uh, C-reactive protein with uh, nephropathy in people living with type 2 DM. Congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Cho, belong to which institution? Jinan University, uh, PR China, Guangzhou. Okay, great. Oh. So, you are right now in yes. China? No, no, I'm in India now. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Now we come to the first position again. There is joint winners. And the first group is Ashley Fernandez and Larissa Gomes. Hello, sir. Thank you so much. Hello, sir. Thank you so much. Congratulations, both of you. Thank we you, sir. Thank you, sir. The same institution. We are Jesuit brothers. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. So Jesuit yes, sir. brotherhood. They all belong to St. Xavier's Mumbai. So over to Sudeshna, ma'am. Congratulations, both of you, for your wonderful paper presentation on isolation and cloning of endolysin gene from Klebsiella pneumonia bacteriophage into Escherichia coli BL21 strain. Congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank ma you, ma'am. And I, I really appreciate this culture that while working in a group, you are working with an unknown finding and that yes. finding will take you somewhere. And yes. precisely, I believe in that. Yes. See, yes. I also engage my postgraduate students with a practical, I call it practical come project. So that results which they get, they are not prepared for it. So when they do it, they get a result and that actually can give a good paper. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And, and, and I am happy that the, in our sister institution, the same thought is being followed. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, this brings me to the last award presentation. That is Shutitho Dash and Orpun Kumar Pal. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks sir. So, you belong you. to... I am from University of Calcutta. I, I am okay. from Gurudash College, Calcutta University, undergraduate. Okay, Sudeshna ma'am, please do the honors. Yes. So, congratulations both of you for your wonderful paper presentation on association between KIF1A gene and uh, microcephaly in Zika dengue uh, in a co infected patient. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Sudeshna ma'am, for doing sir, the honors. And sir, I have to. Yeah, please. Sir, I have to tell you something. Please. Sir, I just want to thank uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arup Kumar Mitra. Uh, so take all this pain to organize such a nice uh, three day long uh, webinar. Uh, conference. It was very it was grand success. I just want to congratulate you. Not only that, I just also congratulate all my organizer students, all external and internal participants, and last but not the least, all my faculty members who actually uh, praised uh, their, uh, praised and evaluated their presentation. Just for uh, all of them, I am just, I just want to congratulate all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. It's all possible because of your, you all, we all are together. We are the extended family, the microbiology yes, family, sir. but this family now meets only in virtual platform. Yes, sir. yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, so now it's time to recognize my tool. All those compatriots with whom I have organized this modern trends in microbiology chapter 20, I'm sorry, chapter 17, 2020. You see, this already at the outset, I said this was not easy because we couldn't meet face to face. 
and at any time at any time they used to call me in spite of my schedule i used to make it a point to solve the problem and really i don't know unknowingly i developed a heart to heart connection with all these students and now it's time to recognize each one of them with my love and best wishes i start with the registration committee and the, from post graduate department when i call your names please i want to see you and congratulate you rajnandini roy and ritu shri ganguli from undergraduate department thank you so, so where is rajnandini thank you sir okay. congratulations and ritu shri congratulations thank you sir publicity this is another very important committee because definitely this webinar was successful because we publicized a lot and only i was going through the chat line in the uh, this last 3 days in youtube they were actually thanking you for this information sharing so that they could join so i would like to thank prapti rosario from post graduate department and srijit saha from undergraduate department where is prapti yes so, sir prapti, thank you very much thank you sir and i really liked your dance wonderful mm -hmm. performance <laughs> thank you sir and where is srijit sir srijit i liked your piano recital a wonderful thank you so wonderful much wonderful editing fantastic congratulations so, all thanks to meghna di sir wonderful now we come to publication publication of dna again this is a very important issue because this particular magazine this particular journal whatever you say is the annual publication from our department and it goes to different places but this was challenging because this is the e version so it will actually reach different institution in different parts of the country and abroad and i would like to congratulate shobhik banerji from pg and boibhobi bhattacharya from ug for this wonderful so congratulations boibhobi and shobhik thank you sir this thank you beautiful sir. magazine and actually though we thought of not printing it but i got three four copies printed just to keep a memento with me because you know i am this person who started this modern trends in microbiology from 2004 onwards and i have maintained all the volumes the hard copies so your work will be lying with me till my last breath thank you very much thank you sir we come to design designing is really tough you know why because designing is not only designing a particular say logo designing a particular cover page designing a particular banner but designing is also about the pages youtube pages designing the program the e editing of the video and it was done spotlessly by meghna talukdar from pg and spandon mojumdar from ug so where are you congratulations to thank both you, of you sir. thank you thank wonderful you, job wonderful job where is meghna sir here meghna congratulations fantastic thank you so much sir and fantastic thank performance you. as well thank you sir now we come to presentation committee and that was shayanton josh and upol chatiji from pg and ug so thank you for your help where is shayanton and upol i'm here so thank you very much upol thank you sir thank you shayanton for your contribution we all made it possible together for the outhouse 
presentation i could see it was a relentless work because it was almost 5 hours they were together and they did it so efficiently minakshi garg from pg and shishu roy from ug so thank you very much minakshi and shishu yes sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thanks a lot streaming streaming again is a very important issue right moment you have to stream in the youtube and people can see us so it was ably handed by devdatta das and spandon shaha thank you very much devdatta and spandon thank you sir thank you thank you sir this group we didn't see them but they were working day and night last two days because they were preparing the e certificates i want to specially thank shantan shaha from pg moinak bera and shishra mukherjee from ug so thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you so much sir your work that we could give the certificates in time thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir and it brings me it brings me to the cultural program i don't know how many of you have seen the cultural program if you have not seen please see it in youtube it is available and it was very nicely coordinated and i am i will be also seeing the cultural program tonight the third day already the the the, the flyer has come to me covid or more din is something like that i think so thank goes to shampurna ghosh who is a beautiful dancer shampurna thank you and shinjini dotto thank you sir thank you so thank much thank you sir thank you sir khub bhalo hoyeche babu oshadharon thank you sir thank you sir i want to thank the mc d1 ongshu ongshu so all through the day all through the day you, i should say thank all through the so evening much. you were active and there was no mistake so thank, thank you, you very sir. much ongshu thank you i know it was lot of tension but you did it well thank you sir this mc for day 2 was kritika shaha thank you kritika you also did a wonderful job where is kritika day 3 was a big day it started from 9 am in the morning and it is still continuing all through the day it was ably conducted by moitri sarkar shashwat ganguli shishu roy and minakshi kar thank you very much let me see all of you together thank you sir thank you so thank you sir thank you sir see these things that you know stage fright is a big thing though you are speaking in a virtual platform but it gives lot of training and you can speak spontaneously like that i am speaking now so this quality is not present in every person so i really like the way you have conducted the program thank you very much thank you sir now i would like to recognize the core committee members now you see this was so important unlike other years this year we could only select some of them but all of them worked like a well coordinated team and it included moitri sarkar srijan bhattacharya madhura mondol swarnika roy tanishta biswas and suchandrima bhumi all of them i want to see and i want to thank each one of you so thank you very much you all made it possible thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir maybe you, sir. you are all thank you sir staying at home but i told you even staying at home can be so effective and you all proved it thank you sir thank so you, much sir. Thank you sir. to the organizing committee they have really worked uh, hard 
they have been to work for work for anyway, anyway it is it is it is a well coordinated teamwork you see the first thing is if you are having problems amongst yourself but that never surfaced so that's the credit of all of you you worked like a coordinated team that's important ug the core committee included kusum maheshwari spandan majumdar onkur chattopadhyay astuti borua and niti choudhury i want to thank all of you i want to thank specially the core committee members because you maintained a close coordination with the pg and there was no problem whatsoever the problem was easily sorted out so thank you very much let me see each one of you kusum spandan thank you sir thank you sir and me thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir so we all made it together and my work will be incomplete if i don't talk about the webmaster who was working behind the screen but they were always present omni present and any time every time the net connection was not proper it was vacillating so i was out again i was allowed in by niti and suchandrima so special thanks to niti and suchandrima the webmasters for these three days so i want to see niti thank and suchandrima and i thank you sir thank you my pleasure now this program will not be possible let me tell you it was never possible without the student conveners every time you know every time by while i conduct this modern trends in microbiology i don't know how many more years i will be continuing this because i am also getting older but every time i develop heart connection with the convent you know the reason the reason is at any point of time they share their difficulty and i share my difficulty with them and thereby we develop a friendship this friendship knows no age barrier and immediately we are talking at any point of time any difficulty they help me and so i want to specially thank the two conveners my right hand and left hand onkita dotto choudhury and priyash mukherji please i want to see you and i want to congratulate you and thank i you want so to much, sir. i want to really express my thank you sir. deepest thank you. regards because of your leadership it will definitely take you a long way ahead thank you so much sir really thank, thank you very so priyash yes sir i'm here So Piyush, thank yes, you very I much. I also, I also want to yes, thank and congratulate them. Yes, Sudeshna ma'am, please. The end. The last comment should be from you. Thank you, Sudeshna so ma'am. So it's very, very. Yeah, you have made wonderful hard work. Sir, ma'am, it together. wouldn't have been possible so, without your guidance and support. It all because of. No, Arup sir is there, and Arup sir actually guided you. I also want to uh, thank you. Uh, so Arup sir, you just you please just continue. I just want to thank the thank organizers you, sir, and I have the convention. nothing more thank to you. say. I have nothing more to say. So this brings me to an end of the recognition, thanksgiving, prize distribution, and I would also like to thank all the colleagues of the Department of Microbiology year after year. they are helping me they are helping the head of the department in conducting this modern trends and i honestly believe that this particular event modern trends in microbiology has become a special event of sensevieres and talk of the town so let this continue this let this legacy continue i don't know how many young students from junior batches are listening so the now the owners goes to you and it's up to you whether you will be able to conduct 
Modern Trends in Microbiology, Chapter 18, 2021, next year, with this sort of expertise. I definitely believe you will be because this legacy must continue. Person is not important. The department is everything. And we all live together to make this department like an extended family. So I say like this, do you see what I see? I see. SXTC. <laughs> Thank you very much. So with that, we come to an end of Thanksgiving. And I believe that next year again, we will have this opportunity to meet and have the Modern Trends in Microbiology Chapter 18 with such pomp and grandeur. And maybe by that time, the world will be free from this COVID menace and we will have a actual seminar in the auditorium of St. Xavier's College. But definitely now I am giving a second thought that some of these lectures we really can have in the virtual platform because by this you can reach out to more people. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you, sir. Uh, this That brings us to the end of our first, I mean, our last technical session for modern trends in microbiology. And uh, we'll quickly uh, move on to our cultural event, the links for which will be shared with participants in their WhatsApp groups. Uh, also, uh, the feedback link has been shared. Please uh, make sure to fill it up. And uh, to my dear spectators, thank you for your patience. Uh, I would uh, like to sincerely apologize on behalf of everyone if there were any technical glitches or anything otherwise. And um, the certificates will be uh, sent uh, as soon as possible, but uh, please bear with us for, um, or in case it takes any longer. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys uh, the cultural event. Uh, and I'll quickly go over the names of the participants behind COVID Nashini. That's the name of the drama. Uh, it's a cultural production from third year UG department. I mean, UG of microbiology. And the script is written by Spondon Shaha. The guitar is played by uh, Shashwata Ganguly. Piano is by Srijit Shaha. Dance performances are by Neeti Chaudhary, Shinjini Datta, Sanjana Lahiri, and Shirsha Mukherjee. The percussions are played by Pallav Ghosh uh, and also uh, includes uh, Shashwata Ganguly, Shoni Chattopadhyay, Liana Mukherjee, Stuti Barua, and Molla Dashgupta. And the short play is acted out by Pallav Ghosh, Shashwata Ganguly, Niti Chaudhuri, Sanjana Lahiri, Piyash Mukherjee, Molla Dashgupta, Spondon Shah, and Unku Chattopadhyay. And Special appearances for voiceovers goes to Dr. Arup Kumar Mitro, Associate Professor Dr. Joydeep Ghosh, and our dear student convener Onkita Dotto Chaudhary. Editing and video making and sound mixing goes to uh, Spondon Mujumdar, Meghna Talukdar. And uh, I guess that will be it. Uh, I hope to see everyone at the other end uh, in the uh, cultural program. And until then, please take care and good night. <laughs>